He is a six-time Bassmaster winner. He is a 13-time Bassmaster Classic qualifier, a two-time Bassmaster Angler of the Year with over $2 million in Bassmaster earnings. From Rathdrum, Idaho, the prodigy Brandon Polnick joins me this week on... I'm Bob Cobb for the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Welcome one, welcome all friends, family, freeloaders, fishing freaks. You're all welcome here at the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast. That goes by my last name, which is Mercer. Welcome into the 145th edition of the Mercer Podcast. And happy hump day to all of my humpers that tune in each and every Wednesday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. Or whatever day you choose to watch this. Um, thank you. Thank you all. I mean, a few weeks ago, I, I talked to you guys about how important it was for you guys to help me stroke the algorithm. You guys have done a great job, so keep it up. Make sure you leave comments, reviews, whether you're watching the streaming services or comments down here on YouTube. I mean, even if you just leave a thumbs up, that, uh, that well, that strokes the algorithm and it allows this podcast to go out to more people and allows me to do this more often. And, um, well, it, it makes me look like a less of a failure to my family. So help a guy out and help me stroke the algorithm. Uh, I hope you're all having a great week. Uh, it looks like the weather's starting to get better in in the southern United States, I think. I mean, no snow. I, I, well, I don't know. I'm in Canada. We're surrounded by snow and snowmobiles right now. Literally, I did a podcast with Swindle a few weeks ago. And on that podcast, they talked about how we have no snow and um, none of the lakes are frozen. Well, literally... From the moment I said that, all it's done is snowed. So I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If it was my fault, I do apologize. But I thank you for coming in here this week. And um, I understand there are a lot of podcasts. There are a lot of fishing podcasts. It seems like there is a new one each and every day. There's one being launched. And um, I welcome them all to the podcast world. So I understand there is a lot of competition for your views, and I am thankful that you guys spend the time on this show. Because really, I mean, all that I can say, I mean, there's a lot of shows that offer a lot of different concepts and things like that. I mean, all I can tell you is I try to have real conversations with uh, real friends. And uh, I mean, I think last week's show with the Johnston Brothers was a prime example of that. Um, that is literally what a conversation is like with them, whether we're recording it or not. Well, if we're not recording it, it involves probably more beer and swear words. But other than that, that was literally a straight-up conversation, just like when you call those guys to talk to them. So I thank all of our guests for being on here, and I'm telling you this week's guest obviously is a huge following and um, a great thinker. I I've always said that I believe he's one of the great thought leaders in our sport um young anglers look at him to drive the future you, you know he just has a good way of thinking about things and um i can guarantee you this week he takes this podcast in a different direction than maybe it's ever been i mean we well i mean he talks about books and stuff like that that i normally don't deal with but without further ado Let's hook up with him in Rathdrum, Idaho, the prodigy, Brandon Pollock. Brandon Pollock, this is the awkward part of the podcast where we're supposed to act like we haven't been talking for a few minutes, but this is even more awkward because I said that a few minutes ago and then your internet froze. But hey, how are you? I, I'm doing great. Like Those are Idaho problems. You know, Internet cuts in and out. Uh, I, we have Starlink. Cause we use it on the road and I know Rick Clun just got Starlink. Maybe I yeah. just need to start using my Starlink at my house so that it's more reliable. I don't know. The whole Verizon Wi-Fi thing I got going on is not meshing with my computer lately. So you have Starlink. You just screw that. Let's make this more challenging. Well, we have cameras at the house so that when we're gone, we can see what's going on. And if we take the Starlink on the road, then we don't have internet here to be able to see the cameras. So we have a different internet. 
it was working great. It was phenomenal. I don't know if they sold too many of them. It bogged down the system. What's going on? It's not nearly as good as it was. Well, you're you're good now. You're good now. Thank, thanks for doing this. How's yeah. things with you? Got an extra extra life in your family now, which is now a family of four, not including Kyle. Yeah. Yeah. The joke lately has been, I have three kids, one with a mustache. You got two kids under two and a third child with a mustache. He's a 34 year old. Had him when I was two. Yeah. Uh, no, it's, it's definitely a lot busier. Uh, I was actually thinking this morning when I was making coffee and stuff and I was, it's like, man, kids are like trying to break down a body of water. Like you go to it, you get a new kid, go to a new body of water. And you're like, I have absolutely no idea where to start. Cause this is nothing like the last place I was just at. And you're just trying to figure it out. And you're trying to figure out all the little clues and pay attention to all the little signs. You're like, And then you start putting the pattern together and it all starts coming together. And you're like, this isn't so bad. It's not so hard. Sometimes you never figure it out. You end up in 90th place. We all know those kids. Yeah. Yeah. Some of these people, some people watching this might be those kids. I might've been one of those kids. Ditto. <laughs> Actually, I know for a fact I was for a while and it was nobody's fault, but my own. I don't remember it, but everybody that was part of my life early on, I guess I was a great baby. And then sometime around the, where I was able to talk, everybody thinks that I was the devil spawn. Come on. Were you really bad though? Because I, I don't, is it just like family stories or do you think that you were like a legit bad kid? If it was just my mom, I'd be like, Oh, whatever. Like I was just tough and she was young and that was that. But it's literally everybody that knew me in that time frame says I was a terrible child. I don't know all the details. I know one time, uh, and I'm, I'm old enough, so I guess CPS can't get called to my mom. But I was I was just screaming in the car. And who knows how long I'd been screaming, but I've heard this story. That my mom got so frustrated that she just had one of those giant uh, like gas station cups of Dr. Pepper. And I would not shut up for anything. And she just instinctively grabbed that whatever 64 ounces of Dr. Pepper, it, whatever it was, and gave me all 23 flavors straight to the mouth, straight to the face in the car. Like I threw it at you. Yeah. Backseat. I'm facing forward. She just takes all 64 ounces, all 23 flavors of Dr. Pepper straight to the face. She said, I shut up because I couldn't breathe. It was straight sticky sugar water straight to the face. And I shut up. And uh, I guess that was the kind of stuff that had to be done for me to to be tamed. And then I turned into a nicer human being. Hey, I don't think that's bad. I mean, there's been a lot of kids who've been hit with a lot worse than Dr. Pepper, to be honest. So uh, I don't I don't know where that was going. That was going way out in left field already. But yeah, kids kids are like breaking down a new body of water. You got to figure them out. They change, you know. Mother Nature throws you something different. All of a sudden, you're like, oh, the lake's three feet higher. Sleep regression. Okay. Figure this new pattern out. And you can't compare it to the to the lake before. Like, if, you, if you're searching no. for what you had in the lake before, you're like, oh, I know how this works. There's no way you're going to figure it out. No. We, we tried that. Totally different. First <laughs> one, first one we now know was abnormal on the easy scale yeah it was just easy two weeks old sleep for six hours a night no big deal she sleeps 13 hours a night now most of the night most nights the other one not so much every two hours yeah. but the last two months has been survival mode pretty much between tiff and i she's getting the brunt of it because i still gotta get work stuff done fishing stuff done she's taking most of it but 
I, we, we both feel like we're on a, on an upward swing now, which is good timing because we're getting packed and getting ready to leave for the season already, which is mind blowing to me. I mean, I feel right around this time of year, I don't know if I'm abnormal, but I feel like a, and I have nothing to handle like you, but I do feel like a, like there's a pressure, like, Oh boy. I mean, I used to have all this time, but I'm going to hit the road and, and it'll, there'll be no time. Yeah. Your trip and the amount of time you're away is, you know, and I, literally I go away for five days and fly home and five days fly home. Um, do you get ang anxious or anxiety or is it just your life? I'm pretty used to it Yeah. at this point. Um, Tiff's used to it. It's just kind of our normal of what we do but every single year i'm like i'm not gonna wait till the last minute to pack i'm gonna wait till the last minute i think you and i have had this conversation of like even sponsorships and stuff like i'm gonna get it all done by october and then i'm just gonna coast through the holidays and it'll be nice and calm it never happens ever like this week i'm like i have to fly out tomorrow to go to a show i'm still trying to pack my tackle my new Tundra is still getting lifted and wheels and tires. And I, I just got the camper finished being built. And to be honest, I started the process in October, hunted a bunch in September, October came around, got the boat rig, broken in, got a lot of tackle organized, got the shop pretty organized, you know, late November, December started working on building the camper out. And then it's like, here's another baby, which I mean, obviously we knew she was coming for nine months. So it wasn't just a surprise baby <laughs> popped out, but I felt like I actually tried preparing and then you can only prepare so much. And then you have to kind of just dive into the unknown and take it as it comes. And what I've learned and what keeps me from getting anxious is that we always figure out a way to make it work. Yeah. And, and I think what happens is you, it forces you to prioritize like what has to be done and what would just be nice if it was done. You know, like I, I would love to have all of my tackle done for Toledo and like rods rigged and be ready when we leave here. But the reality of it is in this last week, I've kind of pushed that aside and said, just get all of the tackle you need, get all the rods, the reels, like get everything together and make sure it goes down to Texas with you and then prep it that week before. Cause we'll have a, a week gap between when everything gets wrapped and then when it actually is game time. So I'm like, I'll have that week to sit down for a couple days, rig stuff for Toledo, uh, and not stress about it now as much as I would like to have done. Do you, do you, do you really stress about things? Like at this point in your career, you've done it for a long time now, uh, it, but do you still like, what is the feeling? Like, what are you feeling in your head at this point in the season? don't get i don't get stressed about the the process uh i just don't really stress about a lot but it's just trying to make sure that as many things are in order as possible so that when the elites do start i don't have to worry about those other things right so like getting all the stuff in the camp or prepped or whatever Four, four months or something, right? And, and then last year, by the end of the year, it was like, oh, we, you know, we've had a kid for over a year. We got that figured out pretty good, you know, and, and that was new because we hadn't traveled with a kid. And then you throw another one in, and you're like, okay, well, now, now what do we do? We can't fit two cribs in the closet. That's not going to work. So now, like, we got to rebuild our camper. We got to change. Like you have to make it work for two kids under two, uh, because two kids under two isn't the same as like two 
five and you know five year olds or something. Yeah, you can throw them in a bunk bed. You can't throw a two month old in a bunk bed and hope she doesn't roll out, or even a one and a half year old. It just doesn't work. So you're building bunk it's beds in, and such. I'm building not bunk, bunk beds, beds, but no, cribs. Yeah, cribs. You know, pretty much uh, human approved cages is what it is. And hey, if they get unruly, throw some Dr. Pepper <laughs> in their face. Your mom is going to no. kill you for that, just so you know. Like, I mean, she, your mom is so such a nice person, always so supportive, but I feel like she's going to listen to this and just be pissed. I, she might. She might be, but I mean, I, I deserved it. I don't hold it against her. I think the difference is, is uh, I'm older, I'm way older when I with my kids than she was when she had me. And she was yeah. like 19. Uh, so I'm probably a little bit more, I wouldn't say more calm. I think a little bit further ahead. Like if I throw 64 ounces of Dr. Pepper in my kid's face, then I have to clean up the sticky mess. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't want to do that. No, no. Do you still, do you like Dr. Pepper to this day? <laughs> I don't drink any soda, pop, whatever you want to call it. None. All right. Well, I can, I mean, maybe every once in a while with like some whiskey or something, but I hear you. I hear you. Not often. So it looks like to me that maybe you, and I don't know that it looks like that. I think you said this to me. You took a break from social media this fall. Was that just because you were so busy with, family or was there any other reason uh it was a combination that it was partially like what i was talking about earlier where you get so busy in time crunch where you have to kind of force feed your priorities right and take a step back and say okay what's what's the most important thing that i need to do right now and for a while that was I mean, it always is. I shouldn't say it was like a temporary thing that taking care of your family is the most important. Um, but it, it just required more time yeah. and energy, right? A newborn, uh, you know, doesn't want to sleep all the time. Like, that just requires more time because I also need Tiff to survive through all of this. And she important. needs to sleep some. So um, trying to be supportive of that. And, and so social media was one of those things that I was like, I just, I just can't be on it. The other side of it and what made it easier for me to walk away was there was just so much negativity. It just seemed like every time I scroll through, somebody was complaining about somebody else or somebody was complaining about a new technology or how many transducers and uh, like, I'm okay with everybody having their opinion. It gets really old to me when everybody is complaining about each other when we're all trying to do the exact same thing. We're, like we're all trying to make a living in this industry together, but yet we're like also tearing each other apart. That just doesn't work. Like not if you want to continue to grow the sport at a big level. And it, I probably shouldn't have just stepped away, but I did. I was like, I just kind of shut all of it out. I'm like, I don't want to be in this battle. Um, and it, because it's not that I don't care, but if, if they said, if everyone said you can only run one transducer, that's fine. I'm going to run one transducer and I'm going to catch them with one. If they say you can run five, I'll run five if I think it's beneficial. I'm still only running one because I think it's better, but just it's not that big of a deal, I guess. I don't know. I, 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 I don't have like the right words for it, um, but I guess just like my personality and my viewpoint on it is – Whatever is within the rules and that and that platform, I'm gonna figure out how to catch them. 
Yeah. And, and like, that's the most important thing for me. And so I took a step back away from that, come back and it's like, okay, now how do you just be somewhat of a positive voice? Cause when you think about it, just stepping away and just letting more negativity to be out there doesn't really solve the problem either. No, no. And I've always been kind of a big believer in, Hey, you can bitch about whatever you want to bitch about that. That's free. But, but I listen to the people that are bitching a lot more when I know they're also doing something to, to try and fix it, you know, or trying to make it better. If, if, but it, there's been a lot of bitching just a bitch <laughs> and, and, uh, yeah. And Hey, I don't think it matters where you fall on, on either side of that, but I mean, here's the other narrative that's, that seems to be have become popular lately. Like if you say the word positivity or negativity, people will be like, well, is it different? Do you want to just be blindly positive or, or do you want us to be real? And, and I think this show, I think our conversations are incredibly real. But I think that one thing I've learned from you is if you, dude, if you bog yourself down in crap, that's what you're going to get, crap. But if you surround yourself with a positive outlook and thing at the end of the day, there's going to be 103 or 104, whatever the number is this year, dudes that are going to launch their boat in Toledo Bend and the season's going to start and they're all going to be focused on chasing their dream. But yeah. this last few months, it feels like there have been a lot of people chasing clicks. Yeah. And, I mean, the reality of it is is that there are both choices, right? You're choosing to be negative or you're choosing to be positive, right? Situation comes at you, and then you make a choice on how you're going to respond to it, uh, you know, or, like, something changes, you make a decision on how you respond to that. Uh, like every human has the ability, well, should have the ability, I guess not everybody. Maybe they their brains aren't wired correctly, but you know, most everybody has the ability to choose how they react to a situation. And yeah. we make, you know, hundreds of thousands of choices every single day. And choose negativity is actually easier because you you know typically you're throwing the fault to somebody else or blaming something else versus uh you know like putting it back on you or taking the perspective of the ownership of something that's not going your way and that's more difficult to choose that route uh, but it's also a lot more rewarding to do that uh did you see the post I made about like the the garden comparison? I did not. Sorry, you know I could, that I, if I was better at podcast. I'd lie this. and be like, "Yeah, I loved it." Hold on. No, I I was just curious because I I might read it. Some people saw it, but it's on this topic, and I don't know when I wrote it. I wrote it in my notebook, which has all sorts of random things. It's got like. Uh, it's got sponsorship ideas, marketing ideas. It's got lure ideas. It has random thoughts. Show me this mo um, notebook. I, I want to visualize what what your notebook looks like. Hold it up in front of the camera. I don't. Well, I need to see. Well, this is. Uh, I mean, it's just. Black. I just standard black. I was expecting more. Yeah. Now, now I do have this one. I just need to find paper that'll fit in it. My buddy Nathan Adams got this for me. Wow. And this is actually uh, real leather that is etched with a picture that I took of the elk I shot this year. So wow. that's the arrow that I shot it with, the elk, this guy raises cattle, then makes real leather notebooks, which is super cool. Very cool. I just cool. have to find paper that will fit in it, and that'll be my new little cover. All right. But, yeah, there's... Uh, I didn't date this one. I usually try to date them. And so the best I can tell is that it was somewhere around the end of 2020, start of 21. Just by going like looking at what was before and what was after it. Uh, so I have, let's see, I don't need to read the first part. 
I don't know why I labeled it day two either, but it says day two. Maybe I was going to try to write in my journal every single day and didn't. You only it, got to the second it, day. <laughs> it, I'm, I'm just going to read it because right, it's on please do. this topic of like negativity. So it's, it says, our dreams are like a garden. Everyone wants one, but not all are willing to put in the work to let them grow. You have to water it daily, give it the fuel it needs to survive. You have to weed, weed out your garden, meaning that you have to release any negativity, thoughts, people, or things that are holding you back. Then, when you have envisioned your garden, planted the seeds, watered it, and protected it daily, you can see the growth. And you must let it develop with patience, all while maintaining it daily. So I, I found that a couple weeks ago, I was just going through this notebook and like kind of looking back at old thoughts and different things. And, and I read it, I was actually on a flight and I thought, wow, like that's, that's very fitting to right now. I don't know why I wrote it then. Like I can't remember that part, but I wrote it down and then felt like it applied to a lot of what's happening right now. And, uh, and it goes back to making those choices every day, right? And you have to choose those every day. And whether you like it or not, you have to make that choice, right? Like you have to choose when you're going to get up and get out of bed and what you're going to eat for breakfast. And there's all these choices. And I mean, you have that ability. It's a great thing about being in this country. You wrote that? I did, yeah. It's very deep, but it's true. I, I think it's true not just on chasing your dreams, but it's the truth of, of life and everything. Like, if you don't, yeah. you can want something so bad. I mean, what's the difference between go to a stick and ball sport? It doesn't, whether it's baseball, whether it's football, whether it's whatever. There are kids who want to be a quarterback in the NFL more than anything. They can't even sleep at night. They dream about it that much, but the dreaming doesn't get it there. It's the dude who gets up first thing in the morning, every single day and spends all day working towards that goal. I mean, I think, I think the word dream is in some ways, I don't know. And I'd like to hear your opinion, but I think it's, it's kind of a lost sleep because people think of dreaming and it's a thought, you know, you dream, you dream at night about, yeah, sure. Dreaming about it. it's one thing, but you, you can't dream your way into success in anything you need to work. And, mm -hmm. and just when you think you're successful, you better keep working harder because there's, you know, swindle says it all the time work when nobody's watching. And, and that is the truth. Like if you're not um, constantly working on it, it doesn't matter how bad you dreamed to achieve it. Do you agree with that? I agree with it a hundred percent. Like, is it a night dream or are you daydreaming it? Right. Like, are you going through the steps during the day to make that dream a reality? So it, it can start with a dream because yeah. I'll just use my own personal experience, but an eight year old kid in Idaho that decides he wants to fish on the Bassmaster Elite series is pretty far fetched. Right. So that it starts as a dream. Like I would love to do that. I would dream, I dream of doing that one day. There's 10 times the amount of kids that dream it versus the amount that actually achieve it. And the only difference in that is what work they put in daily. And that's in anything. Yeah. It can be, you know, it, we just happen to compare it to fishing because that's what we all love and that's what we're in. But that could be, you know, any professional sport that could be trying to move up in your career. That could be sobriety, right? Like someone dealing with addiction and trying to do that. Like that's a daily thing that you have to fight those demons off with. And so, uh, it, it really applies to just like you said, like life in general. Uh, I wrote it more based around fishing, uh, but it does definitely apply to, to life. So how do you feel your garden's doing going into this season? <laughs> um, I, I can see what I want it to look like. Uh, uh, it's 
got a fence around it to keep uh you know keep any wild animals out from eating the goods stealing <laughs> stealing my uh fruits of my labor um I would say all the seeds have been planted and they're starting to sprout. So they're like, they're in the greenhouse. It's pretty cold here. Can't grow a garden right now. They're in the <laughs> greenhouse. They're forming, they're prepping, right? Um, and then it'll be before long, like things will be starting to sprout. Like you'll, it'll be time, right? Like before, before long. So it's all that. That prep work, I guess, like coming back full circle, the more things I can prep now to take off my plate later lets me um, kind of go into that. That's what I wrote about on day one. It was about like practicing and making things habit so that it allows your brain to focus on certain things. Gotcha. Gotcha. Last year, when we did a show, we talked about, I mean, you were coming off an angler of the year season. And one of the most impressive things about that show, you said, I may have won angler of the year, but I know I could be better this past year. I mean, made the classic had, you know, I know you're probably excited to get to grand Lake again, but a rougher year for you. I think, you know, 33rd for angler of the year. How different was the off season for you this year? If you were freaking I mean, you were training with ex-military people in this mountain training deal last year after an Angler of the Year year. Does that mean that that training gets even more so on a pseudo-off year for you? No, it didn't. Uh, um, for me, it was... like Last year was just really different. Uh, because a lot of it came down to execution that I don't understand what happened in certain things. Um, and some of that stuff you can control, some of it you can't. Uh, you know, like when I won AOI, I won by 16 points. There were several fish that I caught, like individual fish that were worth six, six, oh my gosh. So, Someone's at the door. UPS guy is showing up, and my dog is in the office with me. Hey, Crystal hey, clear Bella. audio right now for the dog, just so you know. Yeah, I bet. Bella Bella. sounds great. Hey, Bella, no more. Hey, you're all done. Yeah, I'm sure she sounds great and probably super loud. Bella, it's the same guy that shows up nearly every day this time of year. I don't know why she thinks she has freak out about it. You know, it's doing, doing her job. That's what dogs think. That's what they think their job is. I mean, they think they got a job. I'm certain of that. Like a dog that people yeah. think they just bark to be a pain in the ass, but it's their job to be like, eh, there's somebody here. I need to let them know there's somebody here. I know. And I, I try to not get on her too much about barking because I'm like, you're protecting the house. Like there's a person you don't really know here. You're protecting. So I can't really get mad at her for that. Like you have to understand where she's coming from. Yeah. Uh, but not right now. Terrible timing. We're Terrible podcasting. Timing. Damn yeah, it. She, she needs to be more aware of her surroundings. Right? <laughs> so off season training. Uh, last yeah. year or no, last year you were yeah. telling me about um, things happened, you know, fish yeah. losses that, that you can't explain. Yeah, and, and the year before, I caught fish that I also can't really explain. Like Chickamauga, I catch a seven-pounder when I have four bass, and I've got 10 minutes left to go on day two, and I catch a seven-pounder. That's individually worth more than 16 points, and I win AY by 16, right? Like, that happened over and over and over again last year. Or, sorry, in 22. Last year, I felt like I made AOI decisions, but I executed just good enough to make the classic. And uh, and some of them I can look back at and say, okay, yeah, you set the hook way too early. Um, you know, like make the adjustment of being able to see them coming to eat your bait 
let them eat it a little bit longer. But then some of them I can't explain, you know, and it's literally just the difference of the year before the bass had one hook right here and you land him this year. He's got one hook, same hook, and he jumps and comes off. Have no explanation for why that happens, right? And as, like, I, I want your opinion on this too, but I I only start to second guess everything. That's that's where my brain first goes, right? You lose one and you're like, it's got to be the hooks. It's got to be the rod, the line, the, like, the reel, something, my boat. A both the wrong color. Like you start second guessing all these things. And then I always find myself taking a step back and being like, no, you've literally won hundreds of thousands of dollars on this exact setup and caught thousands of bass on this setup. It's just gonna happen. It's not it's not your fault. Like, do you ever get that way? It, yeah. I I think I do. I mean, I think everybody does. But I, I want to ask you a question first. That year when you won Angler of the Year, the previous year, did you have as many times in your head? Were you second guessing as often, or was it more split second decisions, so certainty almost? Oh, there was definitely more certainty because that that snowball effect rolls both directions. Yeah. Right, of talking about like being in the zone in, and so the the difference between the guys that are good and the guys that are great are the ones that can write that ship faster. Because it it doesn't matter who you are on the sport; it's gonna roll both directions. There's just there's too many variables. There's too much good competition, and so it's it's minimizing like those bad days and right? making the decisions to do that. Because in like when you're on a path and everything is rolling in your favor, right? Like you land that fish that just has one treble hook and that that creates momentum. Uh, yeah. and it's all mental, right? Because mechanically, like all those things that it's it's very small, minute things in your thought process, I think, that do it. Um you know, it's not like I got taller or shorter. I've been five nine, 150 to 155 pounds nearly my entire elite series career. Um, so it's it's a lot of that's mental, right? And uh, and you, I did find myself a lot more in 23 second guessing, yeah, because you know, it was like whether I had control or not, I had lost fish, and then it happened. You know, say you lose two or three of them in a row and then you hook the next one and your first thought in your mind is like, I'm going to lose this fish. I'm going to lose him. And, can't think uh, that. and you can't, yeah, you can't have that. And it, no. it happened to me at Champlain. Uh, you know, like I ended up having an issue on the way out to my first spot. I lost an hour. I finally get out there. I start seeing some fish around. First one I set the hook on, I land, and then I proceed to lose the next, I don't know how many big ones. And there's just one after another. And and I just had to stop, right? Because I had lost all confidence. I sat down, and I just sat there for a second. And I think I haven't told you this on stage. And, and, I, and I, I just sat there, and I was like, you can't do this. Like you because if you continue down this path that you're on right now, you are destined for doom. Like it's not going you're not going to get the outcome that you want, Brandon. So I stood back up and I started casting with confidence. And I I still didn't have the day that I wanted, but I at least got back into a mindset that I could fish. Cause it yeah. was and, it, and it's just crazy because the year before, you know, you don't really have any of that. I, I think, though, I mean, I think what you said hits the nail in the head. And I've said it a bunch of times just from watching guys win Angler of the Year. I use the example of Aaron because I have saw Aaron win Ma Angler of the Year multiple times. And I also saw him have tougher seasons multiple times. 
And the difference between an angler of the year season was he'd just be like, they're on that point. Let's go. And he would go like there was no the next year I'd be covering him. And he'd be like, Mercer, you think they're, you think they're on that point? You know what I mean? Just, he's not asking my opinion. He's just talking the way he would talk. talk. But, but that, that's the giant difference. Like you can't question it. And I think it actually weirdly enough, and maybe I'm just forcing the narrative. It goes back to your garden deal. I mean, because confidence and, 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 and instinct has to be tended to and fed daily. And if you start feeding it negative, which not that it was super negative, but it was the negative result compared to the level that you were at the previous year, that gets tougher. So just like when you repaired things on Champlain, I mean, that was you clawing out. Like it wasn't right up to where you wanted it to be. Mm -hmm. But if you didn't take that moment and reset yourself and start clawing out, it would have got worse. More weeds would have grown in the garden and and it would have been harder to harvest. Wow. This is, yeah. we had no idea what we're going to talk about, but when you look at it, it really, it's all the same. Yeah. And, and the, where you really have to take it a step back is that if I, even though I had a terrible day one there, if I don't flip that switch and, you know, go in a, a better direction, I might not make the classic. And so even though I don't have have the year that I wanted or that I expect out of myself, there's little wins like that in yeah. there. And those are the things that you have to hold on to. You're like, okay, well, I screwed up royally here, but then I did this well. Like, how do I consistently do that better and like not get myself in that position and you, you easily could just fish your way out of the classic just as easily as you can fish your way into it you can fish your way out of it and uh and so like that that for me was kind of a win right of i felt like i clawed my way through and still got to the classic and then the beautiful thing is we're right back at zero yeah like it, it starts all over Right. And so the guys on top are not the bottom and the guys at the bottom are on top. Like we're all even. And, uh, and you don't know, I think that's the, the most exciting part for me going into a new season is that you just don't know what's going to happen. Like yeah. that, that unknown of, of like, is this going to be another one of those years? where just everything clicks and everything just flows because those are magical. And the, those feelings are, you just can't get them anyway else. And, and you don't know, like it's, it's going to happen to somebody. Yeah. You just don't know which guy it's going to be. And it's going to happen to people for periods of time throughout the season. And it's the person who rides it the longest. Uh, yeah, you know, like, and you see that in sports. I mean, the NFL playoffs are going. There's teams that eight games in, people are like, they are your Super Bowl champions. Those teams are no longer in the playoffs, you know. But mm-hmm. it, it's riding it through to the finish line, and it's staying on top of that, which goes back to kind of how we started. It's why you don't surround yourself with negativity. It's why you don't surround yourself with people because that'll just feed on you. You know what I mean? Because if you're out there. And it's not going well, like you talked about in Champlain. And then you start, you've you've spent the last three days with a bunch of dudes who are like, well, no wonder Joy has got 17 graphs on his boat. He, no wonder he's, then you start feeding that. You don't start trying to repair what went wrong. You start mm-hmm. becoming a victim in, in your own story, which ultimately you should be in control of. Yeah, I agree. Do, do you think it is more difficult or easier in a team aspect to be able to control that because you can have all the same guys on a on a football team the year before they don't even make the playoffs they come back the next year and you know they make the playoffs and super bowl champs or whatever you know like they how do you think that's easier yeah obviously uh 
physically, like, they probably didn't get that much better. And is it easier to control that in a team aspect or individually, like, fishing, do you think? I think in a team, because you're all, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, everybody second guesses themselves. But when you're part of a team and everybody, the Detroit Lions are a prime example. What Dan Campbell, their coach, has done with them is incredible. What they've come from is incredible. But it's all literally about belief. Sure, they got a few good draft picks and they have some great players. But it's because everybody believes. Everybody is, and I think as soon as you start to get those moments of self-doubt in a team environment, there's people there to be like, no, no, we got this. But but in, yeah. the exact same thing can happen in a team where – if all of a sudden there's a group of people who are like, no, this coach doesn't know what he's talking about. This is that you can go down. You know what I mean? I think it's easier to stay up with the team. And I think that's why it's so important. Like, I mean, nobody talks about it, but bottom line, I don't know any angler that's ever caught him when stuff's bad at home because yeah. you get that moment of self doubt. And when you get back to your trailer and you see Tiff and Kyle and your whole family, they're, they're like, you're getting them tomorrow. But if, if if Tiff all of a sudden was like, you didn't catch him again, huh? That yeah. weighs you down. Like, I just, I, and I think you can't stay up for eight hours. Like, no matter how positive you are, those voices speak to you, I would assume. 100%. Everybody in the world has some sort of self-doubt. Even, even, like, the most rah rah positive uppity people on social. A lot of times those are the people with the most self doubt and then they mask it with you know, like something else. Yeah. Like that's not their true thing. You see that a lot in comedy and things like that. Yeah. Um and so it's like that's just the reality of it. It's part of being human. Like we have feelings. So you is then it's like learning how to manage those and uh yeah i don't know it's it's crazy to me i, I would say that it's probably easier in a team because you can like you have more people to build off yeah but then it's also like the other extreme right it's probably harder when because you're surrounded by more people you don't have the control of that locker room a hundred percent you could have, you know, half the team is trying to be positive and like, and have the belief, and then the other half doesn't. It's not going to work. No, it has to be all or nothing. And uh, thankfully, my small team of people is uh, pretty positive. They don't they don't look at me and go, "Wow, you really suck today." Well, <laughs> they do, but I, in a nice way. But I know that it's coming from you know a place of us all being smart asses to each other. Swindle, if you I don't know if you saw that show that we did recently, just a couple of weeks ago. If you guys haven't yeah. seen it, tune into it because it is awesome. And one of the things oh, that awesome. I thought was super cool that he talked about, and I don't know that he's talked about before, but the whole PMA thing, positive mental attitude. Initially, it was for him. You know what yeah. I mean? Everybody looks at him now and he's like, this dude's super positive. Well, he had gone through horrible things with his brother passing and different things and he needed to. But when you surround yourself with people that are bringing it up and, and through him, through learning stories of different people that are suffering through different things, firefighters and people that deal with things that make the five biggest fish sound like a really stupid thing to get stressed about. Um, it can't help but be positive. You know what I mean? When you're like, man, this guy's dealing with this. I, so I think that, I mean, it just, it's proof in itself that, you know, that you have to surround yourself and you have to always, I mean, everybody has, everybody has dark times. Everybody has feelings of self-doubt. I think that's, I think that's the biggest question when people come to the elite series. Like, I don't care how many terms you want at home, but the first time you launch your boat, you're like, can I really hang with these guys? And it takes mm -hmm. a while to answer that. Um, yeah. It's wild. I, I know one thing I've learned from like, a lot of world travel. I shouldn't say a lot, but like traveling the world to different countries and 
places around this planet is that typically most every other country I've been to has less than what we do in North America, but yet they seem to be happier when, when you approach them or talk to them, uh, you know, there's people on the streets of Thailand that are pushing a cart around selling a stick of meat for 25 cents and they're doing it with a smile on their face and it's not a fake smile because you'll see them smiling from a distance when you're not talking to them uh, you know and and it's it's almost like sometimes i guess uh like the whole cold plunge thing right or like doing something that is hard is is meant it's like a mental thing yeah um you know like building that mental toughness like doing something hard right away in the morning is like that win um and and it's when it's too easy or too many comforts it's like it allows your brain to just go off into a lot of negativity land but enough on that yeah it's wild it, 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 I mean, I think cold punch is a prime example. I mean, I know it's super popular right now. It's a trendy thing to do, but ultimately you're getting a high because you're going through something hard, but it's no different than the same high that you have at the end of a day after you work really hard to do. You, you know what I mean? It's not, you know, at the end of the day, like, I don't think that, I mean, you're not accomplishing anything, but you are, you, you know, you're, you're, everybody else says, get out of the water. You're an idiot. Why would you do that? But, yeah. but just, you're mentally training your mind. Like, I think it's, I mean, anybody can sit in there, but, but they don't, you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's that challenge between it's wild. Wow. The brain's what, an amazing thing. Yeah. It's what makes guys break down on stage when they win. Yeah. You know, like a guy doesn't break down and cry on stage or get super pumped up or excited on stage because that week was easy. You know, like someone's going to win the classic and they're not going to be like, wow, like, they're not going to break down and cry because they had three really easy days of fishing and everything worked out and it was awesome. It's the thousands of hours of sacrifice and like all of the struggles essentially come out of the guy. You know, yeah. And that happens. Uh, and, and that's it. I don't know. It's like, I think that's why it's important to do hard things or like when, you know, Swindle talking about his hardships brought on that positivity. Like you, and some people it breaks and some people it hardens, right? And it, and hardens in a good way, right? Like you, you're able to see it in a more positive light and things like that. And so I think uh, it's, it's all tied together crazy it's all a big giant life garden that we're weeding out and managing daily so if you're listening or you're watching right take a take a good look at your garden get rid of all the weeds you got Make get to get the hole in your well that sounds wrong <laughs> maybe, maybe start out with a spade or you know, something how Some people work... might just need to go at it with a weed eater. Just yeah. Chop that whole thing down and start over. And and I think that there's people that, dude, for every beautiful garden, I can't believe we were talking about freaking gardens. <laughs> Who would have ever imagined? Like, if I'd have called you uh, up and like, we're going to do a podcast and we're going to talk about your garden thing, we never would have done really it. A garden. Uh, a philosophical garden. Yes, of course. But the, uh, you, you take somebody with the nicest garden. There is somebody who wants to trailblaze right through that. And I think that is part of, you, you know what I mean? That that's, it's wild how there's, the world seems to be getting increasingly more negative. People that want to, and the shinier you are, the, the more you accomplish, the more people come after you. It, it's, it's wild. It's a weird time in humanity, I think. Yeah, it's a good time though. Yeah, no, it's an incredible time. 
Let's talk about a not a good time last year because I don't think I've even asked you about this together. Oh, gosh. You won a tournament last year but didn't win a tournament. <laughs> talk about things not going your way, losing fish. You literally had enough weight to win a tournament. But due to a, you know, fish care penalty, did not win said tournament. That has to be a huge freaking hit to take. To, you know what I mean? When we're talking about keeping positive and everything, but you're like, I, yeah. I did what I could do. Yeah. But it, yeah, it, it's still really weird to think about. Oh, uh, it, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me to talk about it. Um, uh, it, it, first thing I gotta say is, isn't it, it's kind of funny that I won an award for losing a tournament. Won, won the the best supporting angler for the Bassies. Yes. Um, I got a good kick out of that. Much appreciated, but it was like, you won because you lost. Congrats. Uh, that was, uh, I don't know. I, if it would have been any other tournament, I might have had a different outlook on it. And I'm not going to say that it didn't bother me because it did it like it shattered my soul for a second you know because i i know at this point in my career how hard it is to win i know how rare those moments are those weeks are and it was right there it was like right there in my hands like i literally had it had enough and i, I haven't talked about it a lot um and I'll get to that in a sec, like why I didn't really, I haven't talked about it unless somebody asked me about it, uh, is that uh, if it would have been any other tournament, I may have had a different perspective because going into that one, I didn't feel like I had a shot to win. And so I was thankful for being in that position in the first place. I didn't. I didn't think there was any way I had a shot to win. I thought if everything went perfect, I could go in, I could catch a big bag day one, and then that was going to be it. I was going to exhaust that area day one, and then I was going to ride out day one, and I was going to catch seven to nine pounds a day on day two and day three, and I was going to finish somewhere in the 30s. That's kind of where my math had it. And I was going to walk out of there with, and be happy with that because I practice daylight to dark every day. I found what I found and that was it. So I'm like, here, here's my game plan to make the most out of it. I'm worried that a bunch of other guys found these fish, right? They're spawning yeah. fish. The biggest ones I saw the entire week in less than a foot of water. I'm like, how do you miss them? You can't. And it seems so obvious to me. And sometimes things that seem so obvious to us are not that obvious to other people. Uh, my saving grace was that it was quote unquote shad spawn morning time deal. So the guys that had seen some of those fish thought I'm going to go capitalize on a shad spawn, try to get right in a hurry. And then I'll go pick off, you know, one or two big ones. And the other guys that I had seen in there, you know, I draw boat 68, 69 or something day one. And I'm watching like a hawk because I'm so nervous. And I'm like, well, there goes that guy. He, he's not going back there. And then the next guy's like, he's not going back there. Next thing you know, you're calling my name. And I'm like, nobody went. <laughs> like, I have free reign. And, uh, and then I'm like, so I just start at the front. I never saw a boat until nine o'clock and I've already got 19 pounds before I see the first boat. Like game plan works out perfect. Right. So that, that started that momentum and then day two comes around and I think, well, I left a two pounder and like maybe a three pounder back there. Like I'll start back there and see. And I fished super free and just made adjustments and calls and you know i would see a stump on my mega 360 
Next thing you know, I catch a four pounder off of that. Like, oh, new pattern. I'll do that. Then I see a brim bed. Then I catch a big one off of a brim bed on a drop shot. I'm like, okay, I'll do that. And, and I started putting these pieces together. And next thing you know, it's day four and we're launching. And they're like, you're still in the lead. And it was like, you led day one. And day two, it was like, every day I came back to the stage, I'm like, I can't believe it worked again. And then day three is like, I can't believe it worked again. And day four got tougher. Um, you know, the, the weather got cloudier. It's a little bit colder. There weren't a bunch of new fish showing up. Obviously hindsight's twenty twenty, But in that moment, I wasn't going to let myself just sit there and hope that I was going to win. I was, I made the decision, you know, I said, I felt like I needed one more three pound bite. I didn't feel like 11 pounds was going to be enough to secure it. And I said, I'm going to go run. I'm going to leave this area. I'm going to run some other stuff, some high percentage areas, brush piles, things that I can hit fast. I can cycle through them and, and I'm going to go after it. Right? Like, I'm going to try to capitalize on this opportunity, not just hope that it happens. Yeah. I check my live wells. Look, everything looks great. Make sure they're full. And I take off. I got 45 minutes before I have to come back and check in. And I start running down the lake, just jumping place to place to place to place. Hit, you know, make three or four casts, move, three or four casts, move. And I don't think anything of it, right? Like, don't think about changing my fish. I got 45 minutes, catch them. I get back to weighing and everyone's like, oh, it's going to be close. And in my mind, I'm thinking, you blew it. You didn't catch your three pounder. You got 11 pounds and change. You're going to lose. So I, I came back with that mindset and I was okay with it. I was like, it's great, great tournament. And then everyone starts building me back up. Like how much you really got? I said, I weighed them. I got 11 and a quarter or whatever it was They're like you got a little bit more i was like no i literally like what is in bass track is probably what i have because i weighed them and i called them out as close as i possibly could do it They're like it's gonna be really close it wasn't like one person told me that like 20 people told me that on the way to the tanks I'm like it's gonna be ounces and i and you can i've been around enough times i can tell like you and lisa and Chris Bowes, like all the bass staff people and all the media people, you can feel the tension in the air because like, we might have a fish off. Like it might be a tie. We did have and that so conversation in, before weighing. <laughs> yeah, and I can I can sense that, and I can see it in everybody's demeanor, right? And the things that people are saying, and it, so all of that then starts to build me back up like oh i might have a chance and i start doing the math i'm like oh well if i have this and he's got that like, like it is going to be really close but i might have enough like, it, it might happen and i start pulling fit out and i go to grab number three and i grab it like i and i just grab the ball like the floating ball and i'm like that's weird. Pretty sure that's a pound and a quarter or a pound and a half. -er, and he feels like he's about 30,000 pounds right now. And he was stuck to my live well divider. So I had some, I had some screws that had uh, backed out and the little plate that holds my live well divider in there had separated just enough. And I'm assuming when I went and ran around for that 45 minutes that my cold tag had slid behind that and pinned that little fish up against there. And when he couldn't move, I guess he couldn't, you know, swim and breathe and it ended up killing him. And I'll, and so when everyone's telling me it's going to be really close and then I grab that fish, I'm like, my heart sank. Like that, that could have cost me. And I mean, I've cold, I've had, three mistakes where I've had six fish in my live one and a half hasn't cost me yet. So I was due for something to cost me, but 
it uh when when that happened it i don't know like it, i just i guess i'm thankful that i was able to put it all into perspective really quickly when when the weights were called um uh, because there wasn't a very big gap from the time that will davis jr weighed in and then he weighed and in my mind of thinking that dead fish literally just cost me seventy thousand dollars and a blue trophy and and i had to process that very quickly and the conclusion i came to was that a bass nation guy is gonna win either way whether it's me or will right like a bass nation national champion it's on his home body of water it's where he grew up it's like where his bait company is like so when I took a step back from it, I was like, this is just how it's supposed to go. And drama likes to follow me around. And, you know, I just happen to be on the backside of it this time. And, uh, and I never, I didn't go out and talk about it. Right. Cause I easily could have said, just went out and be like, I had it one. I, you know, I lost this fish, it died, whatever. Like, I didn't talk about it unless people asked because I didn't want it to take away from Will's moment because he earned it. The, the perspective I have now is like all those things happen for a reason, whether it's good or bad, there's a reason to happen. The storyline of him winning there is phenomenal. That's amazing. Like, if he's going to win his first blue trophy, it should be there. And the fact that it happened the way it did just made it that, I guess it made it that much more exciting for his win right? because it, it came down to ounces. Like it was high, high stress, high intense, high intensity. And, uh, and I don't know Will really good, but from what I do know, he seems super stand up, great human being. And so you have to be happy for, guys that have put in that much work on a body of water and it it happens right and the reality is that he put himself like he won at fair and square he put himself yeah. in position and he also made decisions that final day that allowed him to win if he doesn't go back and catch that jerk bait fish off a of bed or something like then my fish dies and i still win right so he I had a bad thing happen and it cost me the win, but he also made positive decisions that allowed him to be in that position to capitalize on my fish dying, right? And getting a four ounce penalty. So I was able to process all of that in a very short amount of time and be happy for Will, even though I did shed some tears backstage. It, it was a weird way in too. I mean, the whole way, like, I mean, there was a huge storm coming in. Um, and yeah. we knew that like, we're like, we need to fire through this way and then get everybody out of here safe. His family was there and, and like a huge group of people, but like, I, I don't know, even if you realize, but like when you walk on the stage, I introduce you and I remember me and Jacob talked about how crazy it was, but literally you hear this thunder. <laughs> like as you yeah. walk out the stage, it was like biblical. And then when he wins, it's pouring rain by that time, but all of his people run to the front of the stage. It was super cool. I didn't even know. I just knew you didn't have enough weight to win. I hadn't even processed that there was a fish care penalty. And then I remember yeah. going backstage and giving you a hug and being like, man, this was a tough one. And then I found out what happened. Yeah. But um, that that also has to, back to our original, you know, the year before when everything's going right. You know, even when things are going right in a in a off year, stuff like that. I mean, that has to beat down your your confidence. You know, like I mean, do you just write it off as, "Hey, I wasn't meant to win"? Or yeah, that that's why I say it was different in that event because I started the week with a completely different pers perspective. I, I I came into it saying, "I'm gonna be pumped if I get out of here with a thirtieth place finish." Because I, I 
I have nothing. I got one day and then it is straight scramble mode for two days. And I was able to, you know, like all the things just happened. Like they all came together. Um, you know, and, and it wasn't like, yeah, that one fish died and we, we can put all the blame on that one. But I, I lost other fish, right? Like I lost a five plus pounder on a drop shot. I lost a three and a half pounder on a swim bait. I mean, like you, you just have to look at it for what it is and the reality of the situation. And, uh, I don't know that, that one did not hurt my confidence at all. Like it actually, for me, it was a boost of confidence because I took something that was nothing and turned it into a near win, you know, and in my mind, I was able to say, you caught enough to win like out of pretty much a farm pond. It wasn't a farm pond. It was part of the lake, but like the size of some farm ponds is the amount of the area I was fishing. And that, that was a confidence booster. And I, and I rode that into the next week at the bass open. Not just a farm pond, but probably the most publicized farm pond in <laughs> the history of pro fishing. Uh, yeah. Kevin obviously won a classic there um, a few years before. It was highly publicized. Yeah. How often does that happen? Do you, when you look at your victories, how often are they events where you go in thinking, uh, just hoping to survive this one, and then you end up winning? Or, or are most victories ones that you're like, I got a shot this week? Four, four out of the five elites have been, I got a really good shot to win this week. That's what made Santee Cooper super cool for me. Uh, not only battling it out with Carl and all that just made it more fun and in its own unique situation, but I didn't, I didn't really know what was going to happen. You know, I, I knew that I was around some good fish but I, I had to make a lot of the right decisions to make that win happen. And so that one was super special in that way. My first one, I just had a feeling like this is going to be special. I didn't know what everyone else yeah, was going to find. I mean, you won by how I mean, you, you could go to the hospital in the middle of the tournament and still win it. Yeah, I had like a 14-pound lead or something going into the last day. But it... um. And, you know, like St. Lawrence is like in 2013, I knew that I had something special and I hadn't seen a boat. I was, nobody else was running to the lake. I hadn't seen a boat in days. And, and I knew that what I had found was special, but you don't know what everyone else has. Right. And so those things build throughout the tournaments, um, the open that I won on the James river. Like I didn't, I didn't know that I was going to have a shot to win that, you know, even after day one, it wasn't until really late the last hour of day two that I felt like I had a shot to win. And those are, um, you know, those ones are just different because they catch you by surprise. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've only said each win is special in its own way because it has its own storyline and things that make it unique and special those ones that I, I don't know. I don't know if they're more rewarding because you make the the right game day decisions that catch you by surprise and you're able to win or get close to winning. Um, but it, it definitely makes it easier to swallow a loss when you're not expecting it. Yeah. Yeah. More crushing. And I mean, more crushing too, when it, yeah, I mean, obviously, well, Let's move on because I know you got an appointment coming up and you got to go. So yeah, yeah, better keep track of time. Why do you call Swindle G Daddy? I've never asked that. I've I've hey. heard you call him that many times. Why? It all started was it 2020. It it was Gunnersville. I'm pretty sure it was the the later one at Gunnersville uh, during 2020. Me and Gerald were fishing the same road bed. And 
uh, we both fished their day one and I fished uh, a little bit off and he was fishing more of this underwater bridge part and I was fishing kind of like a broken up section and I, I knew exactly what he was fishing. I'd found him there in practice, but didn't mess around with it. Well, day two comes around and it was like all of my bass turned into white bass. I had one bass and there's nothing around and, and G's over there just winding them in like every cast. And he, he waves me over and he's like, you got him? I said, no. He said, slide up in there and catch you a few. And, and I have a live camera cause I caught him really good day one. And I slide up in there and I bomb and crankbait out there and I'm burning it back and I'm burning it back and it locks up. And I, and he goes, who's your daddy? And I go, you're my daddy G <laughs> on live camera. And ever since then he's just been daddy G and, right. you know, and we're just, I mean, like I'm reeling in a bass talking to Gerald Swindle, telling him he's my daddy joking around laughing and uh I don't know, it's one of those surreal moments i'll probably never forget because I mean, he's he's one of the legends of the sport he's one of my heroes that i grew up watching and idolizing and to be able to have banter conversations like that that's the kind of stuff that means more to me now than you know, fish catches or wins. Like that moment was more special, not catching was more special than catching the bass, right? Like just yeah. that camaraderie and uh, the commentary of that. We got a pretty good laugh out of it. Um, and yeah, and that's, that's why he's just daddy G. Daddy G was born that day. <laughs> he, uh, I, I think I put him in a group. I mean, I've said this about clown and stuff, but I just see like a different, G like not that I mean but 100%. I think that's also your job in life like you should be much different than you were 10 years and 10 years before that you know like you should 10 years from now you should you should be a much different person um but I feel like he's just there's so much of him that is is giving back to the industry and not that he hasn't I think everybody gives back in their own way but I, I just feel like he looks to help more people now um, where yeah. he might've been a, a just more laser focused competitor at other times in his career. Yeah. That's, that's definitely in an age thing. I think that just comes with time. Uh, but that's kind of like that, that old wisdom that you get. Right. And so anyone that's not there yet should go listen to that podcast because it's, it's, it's really cool if you're able to step back and look at it and know that you possibly might be on that trajectory right? and that that's kind of how things evolve. I guess you become less selfish, I guess, maybe, and we're in a very selfish sport. And so it's like, Hey, how, how do you give back or like, what is, what is your why? Uh, there's a really good book. Uh, I think it's Simon yeah. Sinek. You told me about it. Why? I still yeah. haven't read it. You didn't read it. Yeah. Good one. Good one. Uh, Do they have it in, on tape? Or I guess there's no books on tape know. anymore. I don't know if they have it on audio, but yeah. Yeah, on tape. You can watch him give his keynote speech on VHS, Dave. No, I, I think that that is very true. When you look at, at your career, what are the – I mean – when you when you realize I'm an elite series pro, I'm an elite series champion. I'm a big part of this sport. I'm a two time angler of the year. Remove all of that. What is it that fishing gives back to you, outside of victories, outside of an income? Uh, purpose is is probably the biggest thing. Uh, when and it kind of goes back to like the conversation you had with G, but. When, when I started, it was all selfish, right? Like, this is my dream. This is what I want to do. I want to be an elite series angler. I want to fish for a living. That isn't dead. That's still inside of me. That's like still a lot of the drive, right? But the, the purpose 
is not necessarily shifted, but there's, there's added purpose. And that just comes from experience. And, uh, you know, I go back and forth all the time. Like, why do we film these videos? Like, why, like, why do I keep filming all these videos and spending all, you know, tens of thousands of dollars every single year to bring Kyle along and film. And, uh, you know, like it's nobody sponsoring it. Like what, like why are we doing this? Right. Not making any money of, off of it. And then I realized we're not doing it for the money. Like, yeah, I'd love to have somebody sponsor it to offload some of the cost, but I get messages or emails or, uh, like, now people bring gifts to us for our children. Those are super meaningful because even if it's something simple, someone's worked for that money and then spent their own hard-earned money to give something to my kids. You know, and they and typically that comes with some sort of note that says to the effect of like thank you for, you know, being a positive role model for my son or my daughter or something like that. And then, so now that, that is more of the purpose, right? Is then you, you realize that we're not just catching bass. Like we're, we're, we're able to set an example because even if we have some negativity in bass fishing as a whole per capita, human being wise, there's a lot of really good people, right? If you compare professional no, yeah. bass fishing and the amount of felony and crime rates versus other professional sports, I'd say we're probably winning, probably winning that game. And, uh, it, and I think that's, that's now more the purpose, right? Also being a dad is like setting that example of of good humans because we need as many good humans as possible and i'm not perfect i suck some day some days uh but that's but it's that constant process we've talked about it before of just constantly getting better it's like okay i screwed up there i made a mistake learn from it own it learn from it move on and uh yeah i guess giving back's the biggest thing Last question. Uh, no, I got two more questions for you. That was the last question answer. that Sorry, I'm going to ask. And most of your answers are. I mean, they, they, yeah, but but they're all, I love, I mean, it's a, it's a trail. It, it goes <laughs> somewhere. Um, what do you think the future of this sport is? Um, unknown? That's not like a gloomy answer um but just in the fact that it could go a lot of different directions depending on like how we navigate that right because all of us that are in the industry now whether it's people that own companies or anglers or media MCs like we all have a level of influence on how the industry navigates and where it goes and obviously we can't control like stock markets and economies and all of that but just from what the industry looks like and how many new people are coming into it and where it grows uh i think it just kind of depends on how like how those decisions are made right and like what those decisions are made for uh and that's and we don't all have that we don't all have control over that right you and i can control certain things but we can't control other things and and it's i mean it's just it's unknown like we don't we don't really know there's a lot of changes you know you get these a lot of companies are held under big private equity umbrellas and so there's there's less people making more decisions in the industry that matter and so those we need those people to make the right decisions 
to continue this industry in the right direction. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, no, it makes sense. I, and I think as long as the decisions are made, I mean, it, it, we're all stewards of the sport and the stewards before us, I think did a good job. And I think just as long as people just care about the sport and care about the, you know, ultimately, as you said, I mean, it, there's a lot of good people and, and that I have faith in that. I have yeah. 100% faith in. Yeah. I will there's go enough. to war with this group of people any day of the week. And at some times in my career, I have it, yeah. because, but they're good. They're, they're good people. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Get it. And, I got one. I, I go ahead. What do you got? No, you go well, ahead. I mean, you better just ask your question because we're getting close. No, to no, no, you're about. fine. I just texted the person you're having a meeting with and told them we're going to be a couple minutes late. <laughs> so <laughs> where were you going? Meeting. Uh, let's see if I can remember now. Uh, yeah, I lost it. That's how quick my brain just went. Poof. Um, Okay, then I got one last question for you. It's not from me. It's from our previous guests. You get to ask a, oh, answer gosh. a question, ask a question. And uh, last guess were, so I'm a little nervous. The Johnston brothers. Uh, yeah. Corey had the worst question ever. It was like, well, what would you be doing if you didn't fish? Um, which is like the, I mean, you've answered that question 7 billion times, I'm sure. But <laughs> Chris's question was. said that though? No, not one bit. Not one bit. <laughs> <laughs> Chris's question was a little more spicy. He wants to know who do you least like to fish against on the Elite Series? You take that any direction you want. Chris Johnston. It's <laughs> a great answer. Why? He's literally one of my least favorite people to fish against. Because he's really good and we always end up on the same stuff, smallmouth fishing. I don't like it happens all the time. Um, and it happens largemouth fishing too. But some days it's like we're literally running the exact same waypoints. We don't even have the same mapping or anything, but you know, like certain guys will look at bodies of water a certain way and uh and for whatever reason certain bodies of water, me and him, that, and it's not butting heads, but like we look at the body of water and break it down the same way that week. And we end up finding a very similar pattern. And then because he's as good as he is, well, he ends up finding nearly everything. So then it's like me and him are on this rotation and you'll run. And you're like, gosh, dang it. And you're like freaking Chris again. And, uh, but, but I, I say that like, you know, in a compliment to him, it's not like he's a dirt bag and I hate fishing against him. I mean, we have a few of those, but from a, just from like a frustration point on the water of like, really? It's Chris again. And, and, and like, these aren't obvious points. Like they'll be flat banks with two boulders on them in 40 foot of water and i I roll up you know and it's never oh, i ran three minutes and there he is it's like i ran 25 minutes out of the way to cast at these two rocks and he's <laughs> sitting there like, oh, couldn't you just leave like four minutes ago and been out of sight before I rolled up here, just so that I, you know, I would have felt better about rolling up and not catching a bass. Yeah, it's a good answer. You you know how you said earlier you got to follow your instincts. I too believe I got to follow my instincts, and something in me is screaming to ask this question: How many dirt bags you think we got? <laughs> <laughs> uh, like consistent dirt bags, or just. Ones that can like, turn into dirt bags in desperation. Well, I mean, a dirt bag's a dirt bag, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, overall, I guess if you can be a dirt bag in desperation, then you're just always a dirt bag. Uh, probably got four or five. Got a handful, maybe. All right. 
pretty is, good, you know. Out of out of a hundred plus, it's pretty good percentage. Yeah. Is that number going up? There is some people who think that, you know, I've had people say it on here that it's not the same etiquette. People just kind of it's it's a much more pirated world. Let's just say. I wouldn't say no. Always yes, in four or five like, dirt bags. Yeah. Like, you're just always going to have those people in anything. The The difference is, is that's why I said like the desperation thing, right? Is you see guys do things out of their normal character, out of desperation, right? Whether it's cutting a $10,000 check or like that, the the stress or like the, I don't know, not thinking of the right word, but like the, the necessity. Yeah. To, yeah. Like the pressure and the necessity to succeed is overpowering the morals and values of the unwritten rules in the sport, because there's a lot of people that don't break any of the written rules. And, but when they get desperate, they'll push the boundaries of the unwritten rules that are within the sport. And, and some, some people just don't know. They haven't been put in their place or explained to like, that's not going to fly here. And sometimes you just have to do that. Right. And like, you have to set that boundary, that level of respect with guys. Uh, and and so I, I think that's happening more because there's more pressure and desperation to succeed that is overpowering those things, right? And so we put more limelight on like the winning, like the winning of the check and the money more so than like the winning of the respect amongst your peers. Yeah. Yeah. And so that that causes a different uh, like thought process when when it happens, and uh, and and it's easier as a whole. Everyone is a better angler, and so guys are a lot more switched on now than they were before, right? Like pretty much everybody can see you on an offshore spot and figure out how to go catch up on it. They got yeah. enough technology and enough wits about them to like look at their map like yeah he's probably on that point and they can go check it or so you there's aspects of it but i don't there's a difference between people doing it out of desperation versus people that just do it on the daily well yeah but i think i mean i think that's everything like dude nobody dreams of holding up a 7-eleven <laughs> But they get in a desperate situation and they hold up a Seven Eleven. I mean, it's how do how do we change that? Education. Like people just have to know, like that, like between right or wrong, and knowing yeah. that that's that the uh, that's a very short sighted decision, and if you want to play this game as long as Rick Clun, you can't make short sided decisions because the industry is just way too small and odds are you're going to be competing against the same, you know, say 60 to 75 guys for a long time. Yeah. And, and, and if, if you're making short sided decisions for short term gain, going to be a short road you know and, as, and if you are around for a long time it's going to be a really rough road for a long time and uh and i think guys just need to understand that and i mean i'm sure i've pissed people off on the water and made you know cut guys off and pissed them off uh intentionally unintentionally i don't know I think you're in competition and there's going to be times where you cross swords for lack of a better term. I mean, that's a horrible analogy again. That's a terrible one. 
But it's terrible when we're not well, well, here, walking I'll, into the bathroom. I'll follow it up with a better term because we said this the last, I think, the one of our podcasts. But if you shortcuts are short lived, it's true. Like if you're looking yeah. for that short, it's the same thing where people are like, I didn't even want to mention that. I'm I was about to go into a diatribe about forward facing sonar, and people would just yell at me for it. So next part of this is. You got to ask a question to our next guest without even knowing who our next guest is. But let me tell you this. It's a good one. It's a good one. Um, if you could change any, can it be a two-part question? Sure. I would expect nothing less from you. <laughs> if you could change anything about yourself what would it be and what would you change about the industry in its current state okay i think those are good questions because I, re I really want to know I'm, yeah. and i'm curious to see if those go like hand in hand so. well we'll find out on our next show but dude i think this this I, like I always said, we never have really a direction, but I think, uh, I mean, if you, if you really listen to this, this started off with something you wrote in a book a few years ago. And I mean, I, I think it became a, a this is a freaking podcast, Paul Nick. What do you think? <laughs> it's long enough to be considered one. Yeah, it definitely is. <laughs> uh, thank you, dude. Um, I always leave podcasts thank with you. you with, with more questions, but, uh, you answered a lot here this week and, uh, I, I've always said this about you. I think you, you'll never say it about yourself, but I think you're a thought leader in this sport. So I thank you for being a good steward of this sport. I think you underestimate just how many young anglers look at you no different than you looked at Kevin and so many others that came before you. So thank you for being a good steward of this sport. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for All having right. me on. Look forward to the next one. Yeah, it'll, it'll come soon. Well, you got to go to a meeting, so that's it. Yeah, you too. See ya. And that got deep. It, it got deep real quick. But um, one thing I can guarantee you, the world needs a lot more people that think like Brandon Polnick, if you ask me. So I thank him for his time. And uh, something we haven't done in a while, if you're still listening to me, let's do a roll call. Let me know where you're watching from. Let me know in the comments because... Um, it amazes me when I interact with you guys in the comments and I try to get back to each and every one. But when I interact with you guys, when I hear there's people from Germany, from Australia, from all over the United States, all over Canada, but just let's do a roll call because it's, it's fun to find out where, where this podcast is spawned or spewed or I don't know why it went that direction, but just let me know where you're watching from. Enjoy being, have a great week. Go out there and enjoy yourself. And hey, smile at somebody. It can make a difference in the world. And you can make a difference in somebody's day just by smiling. Bob Cobb, take it away. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to. You hear?